We do have obstetrician and gynecologist Dr. Shireen Kalu to talk about five brides with us this morning. Good morning, Dr. Kalu. Good morning. You got it right. Five brides. <laughs> yes. I almost said fry ball as they called it back in the day, not understanding what it was. But Dr. Kalu, I want to thank you so much for being with us here this morning because we wanted to discuss this issue, women's health and the whole idea of fibroids and how it affects their fertility. So let's just talk with, start with what are fibroids? What are fibroids? Sure. So fibroids are, mus it's muscular tissue. It's in the womb or the uterus of the patient. It can occur within the muscle layer of the womb. So it grows in different um, places in the womb. So you have mm -hmm. the inner aspect of the womb, the muscle layer of the womb, and then the outer part of the womb, which is called inner is submucosal, the muscle is intramural, and in the outer part is the subcerebral cell. So wherever they're located, they cause different symptoms, but it's all benign, meaning it's not cancerous. Very, very small percentage can turn into cancer, like a 0.01%. So basically, women who are told they have fibroids are reassured that it's not a cancer. It's the most common tumor that we see in gynecology yeah. in our practice in the West Indies. And it's because it's more common in the, in the black population as opposed to the Caucasian population. And what causes this, this overgrowth, this fibroids? So the various, well, first of all, it is heredit, inherited or hereditary. <laughs> So that's the first thing we have to look at. And once you have a family history of fibroids, it's very likely that you may get it as well. So if you pay attention to your inherited past. And there are other factors that contribute to the growth of it. Doesn't cause it, but contributes to the growth of it. And these are things like dietary, dietary changes. For example, we tell patients if they have high sugar, levels um, if they eat a lot of sweets or fried foods or unhealthy foods that the fibroids can grow more rapidly if they're smokers it is thought to cause more pain and more symptoms and, and it's 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 of course something we tell our patients don't do for many reasons but it's uh, part of the fibroids as well so red meats as well can contribute to the growth so simple things that you may not think about um, we need to encourage patients as part of the management when we're talking about how can we prevent it or how can we reduce the size of it. Prevention is not possible because if you inherited it, it's going to come anyhow you take it. But the growth, the rapid growth of it, we can kind of adjust it so you can change your diet. Mm -hmm. So the summary of that could be the don't eat the red meat, don't eat the fried foods, don't eat the sweets, um, even alcohol and caffeine were added to that list as well. So oh, Dr. Kalu, but it sounds like you're talking about the entire Trinbagonian diet. Well, maybe that's why it's so much more common in the West Indies as opposed to in, in the United States, for example. Mm. I, I, I find that hard to believe because I think the whole idea of fast foods and fatty foods and fry foods is way more accessible in the United States or, you know, we consumed way more than it would be in the Caribbean. I think even in the Caribbean, we still have, you know, a healthy diet of fruits and vegetables. But I guess we have to look at what the evidence says, right? Correct, correct. And it's, it's more the inherited factor. Remember these other dietary changes that I mentioned? It's all about reducing the growth of it. It's not the cause of it. So there's a difference. So we do yeah. see it, but we see it larger in our population as opposed to the other population. Right. And you said that it, it, it could grow in the womb, in the uterus. Talk to us about that. If it poses the same threat, uh, de depending on where it grows. Okay. So, yes, depending on where it grows. So, I like to refer to when I speak about fibroids to my patients, I tell them that it's like talking about real estate because it depends on location and size. So it's yeah. a good analogy to work with. And where it's located is important to know. As I said, if it's located on the inner part of the womb, which is the submucosa, submucosal ones, it can actually it, it, it 
grows within the cavity of the womb, and those are the ones that cause problems with fertility. Not all of them, but there is a percentage that can cause problems with fertility. And having said that, I usually like to tell you that there are many women who try to get pregnant and fibroids are not usually the cause. Even they, they have fibroids, they don't even know they have fibroids, and they do get pregnant. So fibroids by itself does not cause infertility. But if you look at the infertility group of patients, there are about 10% we group as the cause being uterine fibroids. So if we're looking at where it's located, that's important. So the submucosal ones that in, they, they in, indent within the uterine cavity, those can cause obstruction to the sperm um, meeting the egg because it can block the tubes, or mm -hmm. it can cause problems with um, implantation. So when you have your fertilized egg coming down the tube and entering the uterine cavity, if there is a fibroid obstructing it, you can end up miscarrying, you could end up with no implantation. So there are complications of having it, but it also depends on the size of the fibroid. Mm -hmm. And how common is it for people, for fibroids to cause infertility? What, what, are, what are the kind of regions or, or percentages we're looking at, especially in the Caribbean region? So this is what we have discovered in the patients who have infertility issued, um, issues, it's about 10%. So fibroids is about 10%. Keep in mind that when we're talking about fertility issues, we have male and we have female, that we have to investigate both partners. But amongst the female problems, 10% is because of uterine fibroids. So it, it's quite a bit that you, know, you look at, but when you look at the entire population, it's estimated at about 40 to 60% of patients in our population will have fibroids by the age of 35. Wow. And about 80% of women have them by the age of 50. So it's quite a high risk of having fibroids, but the problem is are they symptomatic or not? And if they are not symptomatic, we don't interfere with them unless they're very large. Wow, I am surprised to hear of those percentages, uh, Dr. Kalu. You're Correct. saying that th by 35, age of 35 that up to 50 percent of women have fibroids have fibroids correct yes that's that's the, the figures that we're using and about 80 percent by the age of 50 so it's a lot yeah. it's yes, a lot it is. it is so so you said that you know if the, if they're asymptomatic you don't interfere with them but how how does one know if 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 she has the fibroids what are what are the checks that we do to find out okay. if we have fibroids all right so most patients will come for a routine, what we call a well woman check, and we would do examination and pelvic ultrasounds, and we may discover uh, fibroids. So it may be an incidental find that we get. But if we're looking at symptomatic um, findings for if a patient needs to come to the doctor, we're looking at very heavy periods. So that's one. We can get very painful periods, that's two. They can have a period bleeding in between the period. If you have a, po a polyp fiber that's coming down in the cavity of the womb, they get bleeding in between the periods. They can have bleeding after sexual intercourse. That's another factor. So these are the symptoms that you get with the fibroid with the menstrual cycle. Then you can get other symptoms if the fibroids are what you call subserosal, which is on top of the uterus growing separately, well not separately, but it's coming from the surface of the uterus, then you can get symptoms where it's compressing the organs within the pelvic area. So if it presses on the bladder, they can get urinary symptoms. For example, they may be going very frequently to pass urine, or they may pass the urine and have a feeling that they still want to, they want to go, or they may wet themselves before mm -hmm. they reach the toilet, which is called, called incontinence. And they may get pressure symptoms on the back, so they may get back pain, lower back pain, or they may get symptoms on the um, bowel, so they may have constipation issues, as well as there are patients, I had a patient not too long ago who had a very rare uh, sign, and that was uh, a clot. She had a clot. You know, the talk now with all the vaccines is about mm -hmm. clots. And it wasn't related to anything COVID. It was last year. 
And what she had was this fibroid, which was subserosal, and it was pressing in her pelvic organs and caused a clot in the pelvic vein. And that released a clot that caused her to have um, severe pain that could, that could have been released into her lung and caused wow. a pulmonary embolism and thereby causing death. But she picked up on it very early when she started to, and our, our expert doctors discovered that she had a clot that was managed. And then post management, I had to do surgery and a hysterectomy was done for her and she's completely relieved of this problem because there's no compression on her vein again. So there are rare causes of very rare symptoms. Right. I, you know, Doc, I'm so happy that I'm having this discussion with you because maybe there might be that person out there who might be having these pains or run into the bathroom frequently and not understanding why, you know, Correct. and, and may now go and get themselves checked. But what are the checks that we do to find out if we have fibroids? Okay, so once we identify that you have symptoms described, as I just described, then you visit your gynecologist and she or he would do an ultrasound scan or even a simple examination because there's some people where the fibers are so big, it's as big as maybe a seven month pregnancy. You see them so big that you can feel it in the abdomen and a lot of women say well you know doc i thought i was just putting on weight in the abdominal area but mm -hmm. you could you know once you feel that extension of the abdomen as well you go and you check your gynecologist and a pelvic ultrasound scan would usually reveal quite easily um fibroids it will identify where the fibers are located, what part of the uterine um, walls it's located, how many you have, the sizes, and then with your clinical findings and what the doctor has found with your symptoms, you put that together. Every patient is individualized, so it means that what may be good for you may not be good for someone else. So you discuss your symptoms and you decide what is the best plan forward. How do you manage these fibroids? Is it a problem or should I leave it alone? Right, are there any other ways and means that you can check to find out if you have fibroids outside of a pelvic ultrasound? Uh, they have more extensive tests that can be done, which would be CT scans and MRIs, but they're not absolutely necessary if you have a good ultrasound find. That would be your definite diagnosis, an ultrasound. Right. Okay. So and, and, and that's pretty easy to do and, and pretty affordable. Is, correct. It's affordable and that's important. Yes. And um, it's easy once you have a proper ultrasonographer doing it. So they, in that case, um, I have had issues where patients come from other doctors who've had ultrasound scans. And unfortunately, they're told they have fibroids. And this is really one of my sore points. I do not like to um, manage things like this because it comes from another doctor and then the patients sit and they criticize. I don't get involved in that. It is all about you getting a second opinion. If you're not happy with something, you get a second opinion. But the ultrasound scans are best done by an ultrasonographer who is qualified and specialized in doing that particular type of test because we can get wrong um, responses from other people. Yeah. I always repeat my ultrasound. Right. And, and, and you, we spoke about a bit about the symptoms. I just wanted you to repeat them for us. You talk about, you yeah. know, a heavy period, painful period, bleeding between period, and pains in different parts of the bodies. Are there any other symptoms that we can, you know, look out for that may suggest that we have fibroids? You, you, you've learned very well and very fast. I'm very proud of you. So you can <laughs> teach it now. That's very good. So... Yes, we have very heavy pain periods, very painful periods, painful sex, bleeding in between the period, um, urinary symptoms, pressure on the bowel, pressure on the back, lower back pain, uh, belly pain, and then of course we talked about the possibility of clots, um, as we discussed before, yeah, deep vein thrombosis it's called. So, so Doc, when you have fibroids, are there any way, any other ways of, uh, you know, treating with it outside of surgery? 
Yes, there are. Well, first of all, we mentioned as we spoke about earlier with regard to dietary changes. So first we should involve the diet changes, um, which would make the fibers not grow as rapidly as we expect it to be. Some people believe some supplements would help like vitamin D, for example, and um, stress levels tend to make your fibers grow more rapidly as well. So for some reason, um, we need to tell our patients, cut down however you can, like exercise, do yoga, meditation, to cut down on the growth of the fibroids. And failing all of that, if the fibroids are very big, we have options, the medical options would be dependent on the patient's age and their um, plan for reproduction, if they plan to have children or not. So there's an injection we can use called GnRH, which is gonadotropin. And what that does is because fibroids are dependent on estrogen, because that's when it grows during the reproductive years. And then when you hit menopause, because you're not producing the estrogen in high quantities anymore, the fibroids tend to shrink just a little bit. They don't shrink very much, they shrink just a little bit. So using that information, we know that given this injection, which kind of puts you into menopause, can shrink the fibroids. So we use that to ease the symptoms. So patients who have very heavy periods, we can use the injection to shrink the fibroids. And if they have large fibroids, we prepare them for surgery in the future. Some people believe in using the progesterone part of management. So there is something called Myrena, which is an intrauterine device that can be inserted in the uterine cavity, but that doesn't help manage the fibroids. It helps manage the symptoms. So the heavy period would be reduced. And it, I would say it's a conservative management looking into managing the patient long-term. So it's short-term management for medical, and then we look at other forms of management. The other mm. minimally invasive type of management would be uterine artery embolization. And what that involves is insertion of a needle, and this is done by the radiologists who are, um, they, they, what you call invasive um, radiologists. So what they do is they put a needle into the groin area, into the artery in the groin, and they insert a fluid, a liquid, or, or a sclerosing agent that occludes the blood supply to the uterine fibroid. And basically, the fibroid would shrink and, and um, basically die, if you want to use that terminology, so that that patient would be relieved of the symptoms. And again, you have to triage your patients who would benefit from it or not. There's a beautiful procedure that I had a few of my patients do, but not in Trinidad. It's an MRI-directed um, ultrasound management, where under MRI guidance, the fibroid is located, and then ultrasonic waves are directed towards the fibroid. It's a simple outpatient uh, procedure, and I have seen it work beautifully because it, it's like shattering kidney stones, and it disappears. So patients like that have fertility reserved, and it's important to know what your future is. What is your plan? Do you plan to have children? And these are the options that we would offer. Right. So, so, so you choose the option based on whether or not you plan to have children in the future. Definitely. Your management, whether it's surgical or non-surgical, will depend on whether you would like to have children. So if you're, if you're doing the um, MRI-directed ultrasound management, that one, it preserves fertility. And it's usually for patients who may have just one or two fibroids, not multiple like we see in Trinidad. Um, I've taken out fibroids up to 42, which I've counted in one particular, just one patient wow. in the past. And that's a surgical management where we talk about myomectomy. So this was a 30-something-year-old patient who, of course, had no children, and doing the whole hysterectomy wasn't an option for her. So I had to do conservative and take out as many fibers as I could have, and that's called myomectomy. So removal of the fibers and conserve in the womb is possible. It's a higher risk surgery because of blood loss, but it is definitely possible. And I'm happy to say that patient got pregnant a year afterwards, which is what we wanted. Right. And um, 
again, those a lot of the discussion depends on what happens at the time of surgery, because patients may ask the doc, can I have a normal delivery after I do a myomectomy? And the answer would be what depending on what the doctor finds at surgery. So if the cavity is entered, yes, you have to have a cesarean section. But if it's not, you can, of course, have a normal delivery, which we've seen happen in the past. Yeah. Well, Doc, I, I think we definitely have significant information to help us going forward. We are going to have to leave it there. But I want to thank you. Thank you so much. Because I think we definitely, we know the symptoms to look for. We know the, me the, the different uh, methods available to us to treat with uh, uh, fibroids. We know that there are dietary things that we can do to, 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 to slow down the growth of fibroids. I think we learned a lot this morning. So I want to thank you so much for sharing. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes, you're most welcome, Dr. Shireen Kalu. They're talking to us about fibroids. What? You learned a lot, right? I